RJ Davis and Cade Tyson are both phenomenal three-point shooters, but can they both be over 40% this year? You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? It's Monday, August 5th, 2024. Welcome into the Locked On Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and you're joining me at the place to get your Tar Heels content every single day. Part of the Lodcast Network. I want to thank you for making us your first listen or watch. Special shout out to all you everydayers joining us and everyone that's coming in from the Locked on Tar Heels Discord. Welcome to all of you. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. In the dog days of summer, the sport stops sportsing like we want them to, but this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. Coming up on the show today, it's Mailbag Monday. Love getting into these mailbag episodes. A, because they're so fun to answer all your questions. And B, because it's just, uh, there's usually a lot of interesting stuff. And so I really enjoy these. So thank you to everyone for sending stuff in, whether it's through Discord or uh, Gmail or whatever it is. Love these. So today we're going to answer some questions about three-point shooting, Uh, if Carolina could have a non-RJ Davis ACC player of the year this year, the difference in official and unofficial visits, how Pat Kilby and I met, and more. Dig in. Let's go. Right out of the gate, here's number one. This is from Ven Diesel in our Discord. says, let's assume that RJ and Cade are the two top three-point shooters in terms of percentage and volume. Who's third? (laughs) So basically, we're looking at the assumption and I would agree, is that R.J. Davis and Cade Tyson are going to be the top three-point shooters for Carolina this year, most likely both in terms of both like percentage and the volume of it. And so if we take those guys off the board, who is third? And there's a couple different ways to look at this. You could look individually at who would be third in terms of percentage, who would individually be third in terms of volume, or kind of a combination of the two. Who's probably the, the best efficiency of volume and percentage together. And so I've got three different answers for you. Let's go. Number one, in terms of third best percentage behind them, I'm going to go with Seth Trimble. Now look, Seth did not shoot well from three his freshman year, but it was only a a small volume of attempts. I think it was like one of six, one of seven, something like that. But then last year, here comes Seth and he shoots 41.9%. And it still wasn't like a wild volume of shots, um, but it but it was more. I'm pulling back up. I had just taken the stats away, and I had it pulled up. Um, Seth, last year, was 13 of 31 for that 41.9%. And, you know, I mean, that that is very good. Again, though, not a big sample size for him. And so in terms of percentage, Seth being third on that list, I think that his volume is going to stay low enough this year. I think he'll play more minutes. So let's say he even gets up to 50 attempts this year. I still think even with that few attempts, his percentage is probably going to float around 40%, give or take a couple percentage points, because he's very judicious and smart about when he does take them and has made them at a high clip this past year. He's been working on a shot even more. I think Seth is third in percentage. In terms of volume for third place behind RJ and Cade, you could all all probably guess where I'm going with this one, and that for me is Ian Jackson. I think that he's going to have the minutes, and I think he's got the lack of conscious to just take a bunch, right? He's somebody that even if he's missed some, he's going to continue to shoot them because he knows he's a shooter and they're eventually going to go in. Uh, I believe that Ian will be a little bit of a, a streaky shooter. There will be times when he just makes a bunch in a row and other times where he doesn't make a bunch, but I think he's going to shoot a lot of them. And then the third part of this question, as I'm taking it, is who is somebody that is going to have a pretty good combination of both volume and percentage? And I'm actually going to, I wanted to make it a third person. So not Seth or Ian, and I'm going to go with Jalen Washington for this one. Last year, Jay Wash made a three for the first time in his Carolina career. He didn't make one his freshman year, but was only eight of 15. And I mean only in terms of 
uh, attempts, not in terms of makes, because eight of 15, he shot 53.3% last year. This year, I think Jay Wash is going to have a lot more minutes to him. And that so that the those attempts will probably go pretty far up, I think, because the way Carolina will utilize everyone this year with him probably being outside even more. And I think he's still going to be able to make a good number of them. So give me Jay Wash for the person that's the combo of volume and percentage. Now, one thing I would say is I, I battled with where to put Seth and where to put Jay Wash. I think I could interchange them for who has the best percentage and who has the best combination of volume and percentage. So there you go. Great question. Let's actually stick with three-point shooting for our second question of the day. This one comes from Terry Weeks in an email. <laughs> Terry says, can RJ Davis and Cade Tyson collectively average 40% from three-point range? This is a great follow-up question to the last one because the last one we were ignoring Cade Tyson and RJ Davis. In this one, it is solely about them. And there's a couple different ways to interpret Terry's question here. One way could mean combined the two of them shoot 40% or better from three, meaning like one of them could shoot 41% and the other 39%, but maybe collectively they still hit 40. That's one way to look at it. Or it could be that they both have to shoot above 40%. Here's the truth from me. Regardless of how you interpret that, I think the answer is yes, either way. Let's take them individually and then we can look at it together. Cade Tyson, coming into his junior year, he had two years at Belmont, shot above 40% each of those first two years, his freshman year. He was 48 for 115. That was 41.7% last year, 80 of 172. That's 46 and a half percent. That is just absolutely ridiculous. So yes, I know it's a step up in competition level for Cade Tyson, but his size, the guys around him that he's playing with, I, I, there's no reason for me to think that this year will be any different. And I know we get fluctuations in three-point shooting, but even if he goes five percentage points down from last year, he's still at 40, 41% at that point. And so I, I truly think Cade Tyson, this is who he is. The outlier would be if he was under 40%, not the rule. Now, RJ, on the other hand, is actually the more unlikely of the two to shoot 40%. Why? Because he's never done so in a season in his Carolina career. Freshman, 32.3%. Uh, sophomore year, 36.7%. Junior year, 36.2%. Last year, oh, so close, 39.8%. Now, I do want to give two caveats to that because RJ's junior year, when he shot 36.2%, I truly believe he would have hit 40% were it not for his um, injured index finger that he had. When that thing was healthy, man, he was lighting it up. And so I, I really think he would have gotten there that, that year. And then last year, RJ, 113 for 284, the most three-pointers ever made in a single season in Carolina history. Remember how he went 0 of 9 from 3 against Alabama in the Sweet 16? Literally the only game all season that he did not make a three. So again, that's the outlier. Had like it, doing the math, had he made even one of those nine threes, he would have been above 40%. Just needed one in that Bama game, just doing what he had done all season long. So yeah, I think RJ Davis is a 40% three-point shooter last year. And I think he would be this year. Also, I should say, had he made even one more three against or had not one more because he didn't make any, had he made any threes against Bama, he's also playing another basketball game because Carolina wins that game. That's another part of the like, uh, of that game. Anyway, even though RJ has never shot 40% on a season from three, he is clearly capable of doing so. That said, put these two together, K. Tyson and RJ Davis on a court with Elliot Cadeau distributing to them, them on either wing. I, I truly think you should be in great shape especially if Carolina does end up playing more five out and teams are having to respect their ability to drive. Because remember, Cade Tyson, I've said this over and over and over, took more two-point attempts last year than three-point attempts. He's not a guy that's just going to hover around hunt, uh, hunting his three-point shot. And obviously we know RJ will get to the rim as well. So I truly think that both of these guys individually and collectively 
can and will be over 40% from three this year? Great question from Terry. Now, sticking with the idea of RJ Davis, had another great question. What if UNC had the ACC Player of the Year this year, but it was not RJ Davis? Who is it? We'll get to that question coming up and more in just a second. Right after I tell you about FanDuel, I love sports and I never want them to stop. I know we're right in the middle of the Olympics right now. It's great. But in the dog days of summer, we just truly get fewer games and the sports aren't sportsing like we want them to. But FanDuel lets you keep the sports going whenever you want. All you got to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime you're in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone, every day, all summer long. How about looking ahead to Carolina's first football game? As of today, it's just 24 days away. Can you believe that from kickoff? Carolina travels to Minnesota August 29th at 8 p.m. If you believe in the heels, boy, do I have a line for you. FanDuel has Minnesota favored by two and a half in this game. If you think Carolina is going to take that one or at least stay within two and a half points, there you go. Bingo. So if you want to get in on that, head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Thanks for joining us today on Locked on Tar Heels, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. We're getting back into Mailbag Monday, and this one comes from our Discord from Our Drake Ain't Canadian. I love all these wild names. They're so fun. Who asks... Could the ACC Player of the Year be on this Carolina roster and not be named R.J. Davis? If so, who? Well, if I'm being honest, the answer is no. I do not see a non-R.J. Davis player on this roster being ACC Player of the Year. And some people would say, but Isaac, we probably didn't see that last offseason. No, that's, that's wrong. I did, and I talked about it. Heading into last season, I said R.J. Davis is being sorely undervalued and overlooked for what role he's going to, because of the role he's going to have, because of the opportunity he's going to have, because of the usage, all of that. And I saw him as an ACC player of the year candidate outside of him looking at this year's roster. I don't see it. However, I love this exercise. So I want to entertain it and dream about what could be. So outside of RJ Davis, there are 10 other scholarship players and five of them I've identified as just quite honestly, no path to being ACC player of the year. A lot of it is because of, of playing time or role. Uh, those to me would be James Brown. That's a lack of playing time. Um, Jay w- Jalen Withers, Seth Trimble, Zayden High. You know, I mean, who knows what could happen? They, they get into a bigger role for one reason or another and go off. I just do not see a path to it for any of those guys. And this one might be a little bit controversial, but I don't see it for Drake Powell either. Um, I do think he would get some ACC freshman of the year votes based on what he's going to do for this team. I think the same is true for Ian, but I don't see it this year for Drake for ACC player of the year. Again, future years, I think he could. We'll just have to wait and see how things develop. Also, kind of what makes his skill set so special is not what like voters um, look at it and utilize for those kind of votes. Uh, Next category I have is potentially but unlikely. That for me is Van Allen Lubin. Actually, it's both transfers, Van Allen Lubin and Cade Tyson. I think they are both going to have a role this year. I think Cade Tyson's is going to be much bigger than Van Allen Lubin's. I think Cade Tyson could be the best three-point shooter on this team. I think he is going to be indispensable in a Cameron Johnson sort of way, as he was for those two years. And I love what he's going to bring to this team. But again, I don't think there's going to be quite enough that he does that would validate this. I think I could see him playing into second or third team all ACC status just because of the stuff he does. Um, Van Allen Lubin, I just don't think there's going to be enough usage for him. But if he pops just right, yeah, I, I could see it getting there. And then the final tier, these are the three guys where I'm like, yeah, I could see a path here. And that's Jalen Washington, Elliot Cadeau, and Ian Jackson. As for Jay Wash, let's imagine a world where he just pops off, blows up, and owns UNC's front court, is is making plays around the basket, is hitting from outside, blocking shots, shooting at the highly efficient field goal percentage that we've seen him do. And given what Elliot Cadeau will do for him, right? Like you could see a path to it. Another would be Elliot himself. 
The playmaking has already been on display. His competitiveness has already been on display. If the shooting can catch up, if he can get a higher usage rate beyond the court longer, all of which I expect he will do this year, there's enough that he does well that he could do it. If for some reason he sticks around for a junior year, I think it becomes even more highly likely at that point. And the third, I would say, hey, there's a path is Ian Jackson. Let's just say he works his way into where he's the starting three, for example, and just goes off and has a dynamic season. Everything's working. He's hitting shots. Um, his athleticism is something that that people find very attractive when they're making votes like this. I, again, I don't see any of these guys jumping over RJ, but those are the three guys I could see a path with if, if, if we're um, dreaming in this scenario. Second, or, or next question comes from Edward Beth on our Discord and says, do you think playing Ian and RJ together, which kind of goes back to the, the ACC Player of the Year conversation, in the same lineup may backfire with both wanting the ball in their hands, aka both wanting to be so high usage? This is a very intriguing question, and I'll answer it just big picture this way. It could be a problem, an issue, could backfire, but ultimately, I do not think it will do so. I've got five reasons why we could come up with more, but let me give these to you. Number one, RJ is the veteran on this team and will be will be the one to have the ball in his hands more often. There is just, you know, it's one of those dynamics. You've got a fifth year guy. You've got a freshman incoming who's got to prove himself. RJ already has these four years of consistency, this buy-in from the coaching staff and him bought into them where there's just this belief and trust and understanding. And so there's that side of it with, with RJ having the seniority. I don't, I don't like not, you know, with RJ and Caleb, they were purely peers, came in together. And so there was always that, that give and, and take dynamic that worked well sometimes and didn't as others. We've got a different thing going in this scenario. Part two uh, of my answer to this question, why I don't think it'll be an issue, is that I believe the coaching staff, having seen the struggles, specifically with RJ and Caleb working together in the 2022-23 season, aren't going to let that happen again. I think the, the coaching staff will work well with both these guys to make sure that RJ knows his place and role, Ian knows his place and role, and how to do that. And another part of that is that Elliot is going to have the ball in his hands a ton as the main playmaker for this unit or for this, this roster. I think RJ and Ian will both have the ball in their hands a ton, but they're going to know what they're both supposed to do. And so I think the coaching staff plays a big role in that. Number three. The coaching staff also will make sure that both guys are playing for the benefit of the team and not themselves. If the coaching staff sees this alignment start to get out of whack or one guy dominating when he shouldn't be, I think they will remind them of like, hey, this is about the North Carolina on the front. Number four, um, I think another reason this isn't an issue is because we expect this team to utilize spacing and balance better than perhaps we've seen before because of probably playing a more outside-in style than an inside-out style. And so I think that's actually going to end up being a great weapon for both of them, where they can both have the ball in their hands a ton and it not be an issue. They're both you know, going to have opportunities to drive and finish, drive and kick out, do whatever, you know, like whatever the defense gives. And so I think that's a factor in it as well. And then number five, my, my fifth reason I don't think it's an issue is I think they're both going to be able to identify that it, whoever has the higher usage, it may depend on who's cooking in any given moment. Um, for example, if you watch the summer scrimmages, you noticed, I can't remember if it was the first or second one, there was a stretch where Ian was just hitting everything in sight. So RJ just kept feeding him the ball because it's like, who, who knows what RJ might have, you know, been in right there in terms of his, his ability to hit, but it was clear that Ian was going off. So they're just getting them the ball. And this is what good basketball players do. They recognize that they all go through peaks and valleys. Oh, you're hitting right now. Let's make sure we get the ball to you. We want to make sure that that's going for you. And, and I think it might take Ian a little bit of time to figure that out. Um, but I, I, I think his teammates won't allow him to not do that, right? Like, hey, Ian, if you're going through it a little bit right now, 
Cade is hitting everything in sight. Let's get the ball to him. RJ has it going on, right? What, whatever that may be. And so I'm ultimately not worried about this big picture. Might there be some moments where that's an issue? Absolutely, it could be. But I think big picture, I'm not ultimately concerned, Edward Beth. And, and I think part of that is because of what we've seen in the past with RJ and Caleb. Uh, they The coaching staff is going to know now how to work around that. Great question, though, and I think it's something we do need to at least keep our eyes on and be aware of with both of these guys being high usage. All right, here's where we're going to go to next. We got a great question about the differences between official and unofficial visits. Also, how did Coach Pat Kilby and I first meet? We'll get to all of that in just a second. Right after I tell you about eBay Motors, passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers to roof racks, exhaust kits to LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed or power or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or you get your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit, only available to U.S. customers. Next mailbag question. Here we go. This comes from Mike Shaw on our YouTube comments, actually. Mike says, what's the difference between an unofficial and official visit? This is a great question and one I'm sure that a lot of people actually have. So let me just give you kind of three big picture differences with this. Um, number one, the, the biggest difference is financial. Who pays for this bad boy? On an official visit, the school pays for essentially everything, or at least, you know, a, a good portion of everything that can be worked out. Um, so kind of all the expenses, travel, lodging, food, drink, any, any of that kind of stuff. Part of that is that you're allowed to stay on campus, etc. cetera. Differently in an unofficial visit, the recruit or the, and the recruits family are responsible for all their own expenses However, like the school can give tickets to a game, things like that. That's still okay on an unofficial, but like you're responsible for, if you're flying, you're responsible for your own plane ticket, etc. So that's the biggest difference is who pays. Uh, number two, the difference is duration. There are um, specific parameters for the length of an official visit from arrival to departure, no longer than 48 hours and a school can't provide more than two night, two consecutive nights of lodging. On an unofficial visit, it's, you know, come and stay however long you want or a coaching staff's cool with you staying around. And so um, there, there's no parameters put around that. Um, and then the third big difference, I would say, is the structure. On an official visit, you can't visit until August 1st or after of your junior year. So for the class of 2026, the rising juniors, they can now start scheduling official visits. That's why you're seeing a whole bunch start popping up for this fall for the class of 26. Also, there's some for 25 as well. Um, so there, there's that. Um, whereas an unofficial visit, you can go anytime, you know, freshman, eighth grade, sophomore year, whatever. And they can provide you tickets. As I said, you go to the game. You know, if if you're a player like Kendra Harrison, for example, who Carolina has offered in the class of 26, even though he was a sophomore last year, you saw him around uh, at Carolina basketball games sometimes. It's because it's an unofficial visit and he can just come. It's close to his house. Why not? Um, another part of the structure uh, for official visits, it used to be limited to five official visits. Now, as of July 1st of last year, 2023, there's an unlimited number of official visits you can take, however, only can take one official per school, barring a coaching change. So let's say a high profile one recently is Kentucky. If you visited Kentucky while John Calipari is still there and then uh, wanted to go back and experience it now with Mark Pope and learn about the new staff, you could. However, if Coach Cal was still there, you could not. So that's a thing. Um, and Braylon Mullins, we talked about him a couple weeks ago on the show, cutting down to his top 10. 
He's essentially trying to take official visits to all 10 of those. He's taking advantage of this. And why would you not? It's free. School's paying for it. And you can go check it out and learn more. So that's great. Um, so there you go. Those are the three main differences, Mike Shaw. Um, who pays, duration, and kind of the structure of the visit. Next, this one comes from Kevin Weaver on Twitter. Kevin's uh, one of our guys who's with us all the time. Kev, great to hear from you. Asks this. Will it hurt Ian Jackson being with Adidas, but playing at UNC, a Nike slash Jordan school? Just the first time I've heard of anything like this before. So basically, Ian Jackson, while he was with Overtime Elite, signed an NIL deal with Adidas. But he's come to a Nike school, a Jumpman school, Jordan school, Carolina. How does that work? What's going on there? Uh, this is a thing that happens occasionally, but not very often. Typically, we've seen, let's say, somebody signs with Adidas or plays on the Adidas circuit. They're going to an Adidas school, like Kansas, for example. But if somebody signs with Nike or Jordan they're, or plays in the EYBL, Nike's AAU circuit, they're going to a Nike school. However, there are other times when that's not necessarily the case. A, a recent high-profile example on the women's side, Haley Van Lith, who um, has an NIL deal with Adidas, used to play at Louisville, so it wasn't a thing, right? She could wear Adidas on court, off court, whenever she wanted to. But last year, transferred, went to LSU where she is a Nike school and you can't wear Adidas. So how they handled it was on court or official team activities. She's got to wear Nike. No questions asked when she's off court on her own time, promoting things on social media, knock yourself out with Adidas. And so the same thing will probably be true for Ian this year. Official UNC activities, whether it's game practice on court whether it's you know showing up in the community for something official for the school, it's got to be Nike, got to be Jumpman. However, if it's something you know in his own time or an NIL engagement that he has he has signed, you know, is doing for himself, not in conjunction with the school, knock yourself out. Wear your Adidas. It 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 is a little weird. It's a little odd, um, but I think we will see more and more of this in the NIL era. Um, and so just, we'll just keep our eyes on it and, and see, you know, sometimes it can get weird where it's like, you got to cover up your, um, you know, the, the logo or things like that. Like a famous example of that was Jordan being Michael Jordan, being a Nike guy at the Olympics had to cover up the, the Reebok logo, um, like at the medal ceremonies and stuff. So, um, we will do that now. The, another thing with Adidas even though Ian is going to a Nike school, it's worth it probably for them to get in on him early on the chance that he just pops and, you know, gets, goes off and goes to a big school or uh, sorry, just goes big, gets drafted high. And then it's like, Hey, let's sign another contract or maybe we can get you at like a family deal. Cause we've been with you all the time or, and, or they get first crack at him when he's coming out of Carolina, because it's like, they've already been working in business together. And so, you know, it's easier to fight off Nike or whomever, you know? So there you go. All right. Last mailbag question for today. This comes from Will Allison in the YouTube comments. Isaac, how did you and Pac meet? Meaning coach Pat Kilby. Funny enough, we met through Twitter. Um, we've actually been in the same place at the same time, but it was before we met. That was at the final four in New Orleans a couple years ago, but we didn't know each other then yet. Although we had had some interactions um, in on Twitter already, but the first time we actually like I have record of it is Pack DM'd me on March 25th of 2022. I scrolled all the way back to the beginning of our Twitter DM thread. I think we had react res, uh, replied and talked in like some Twitter replies before that, but I couldn't go back and find those. So this is the first. Um, thing on that. And his DM to me read, for reference, I absolutely would have fouled up three, even with only 4.1 seconds left. One of the best players in the country just got way too good of a look, in my opinion. I should provide some clarity here, but we were just talking last weekend about fouling up three. So Pax DM here was in reference to when St. Peter's upset Purdue in the Sweet 16 before moving to the Elite Eight where Carolina played St. Peter's. 
St. Peter's was up three. What's the guy with the mustache had had just hit two free throws to put him up three with 4.1 seconds left. Jaden Ivey gets to run the whole length of the court, gets off a good look um, from, from beyond the three point arc that just hits front rim and, you know, almost sends this thing to overtime. St. Peter's had two timeouts could have fouled up three. They, they survived it, but we were just talking about how we both would have taken the foul there, made him shoot his free throws. Here's the funny thing though, about Pac and I to this day, we have never met in person. We live about three and a half hours apart. He in Oklahoma city. I just North of Joplin, Missouri. Um, but we've just never been able to connect in person. We've, we talk about it all the time. We need to make it happen. Uh, but we just never have been able to. And it, it's so funny because you just don't realize things about people you only meet digitally. For example, I'm like 5'11". And I never realized until a couple months ago that Pac is like 6'5". And so when we do eventually meet in person, uh, it's like I'm his tiny little short brother or something like that. So I, I can't wait to get a picture when we finally one day do meet in person. That'll be a lot of fun. All right, y'all. Thank you for all the great questions today. We're actually going to have another mailbag episode coming up. I think it's actually next week we're going to do it. So I've got others already dialed up and locked in. But if you want to share some mailbag questions with us, that's great. We've got a mailbag question in our Discord chat. You can email us, LockedOnTarHeels at gmail.com. You can DM me, whatever you want to do. We'd love to have your mailbag questions. In fact, if you're not part of the Locked on Tar Heels Discord, we'd love to have you join us there. It's free to join, and the link for that is in the show notes. Come on for the Tar Heels, but stay for the great community that we have there. Also, if you haven't subscribed to the show, easy to do both audio and video. Make sure you don't miss a second. Other than that, I want to remind you that it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. We'll talk again tomorrow with Denora Searcy. He's joining us to talk about fall football camp. But until then, peace.